I'm okay. We are recording. So yes, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce Andy Hogan, who needs no introduction to many of us here at, um, at Bancroft. He is currently a postdoc here at the Center for Tiptunus Papyri. Andy grew up in Southern California where his parents encouraged his early love of Greek mythology. They bought him books. They watched those classic Greek, Greek myths such as the Clash of the Titans, the Indiana Jones movies, you know, these, 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 classic, <laughs> these classic films. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in classics from USC, his master's degree in Egyptology from Oxford, and his PhD in ancient history from Yale. And he's been with us ever since. His work looks broadly at explaining the evolution of fiscal institutions in the Eastern Mediterranean during the first millennium BC, and how to refine our understanding of how and where those institutions developed in the Greek world the ways they spread to Egypt after the campaigns of Alexander the Great and eventually the Caesars. Um, this is an exciting day for Andy. As of today, we are single digits away from his forthcoming wedding on May 7th. Congratulations to Andy and his fiance. And um, so a lot of fun and happy times await. So without further ado, Andy, I'm gonna hand it over to you and you can educate us on Eastern Mediterranean fiscal evolutions. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, can you all hear me okay? All right. Um, so good afternoon uh, from the West Coast and a hearty hi to anyone joining us from a different time zone or on the recording. Uh, my great thanks go first to the organizers of the Bancroft Roundtable series, Christine and Jose, for allowing me the great honor of speaking remotely here today. A uh, special thanks uh, for that lovely introduction um, and for again, ex extending the invitation uh, and for the chance really to take part in such a well-respected and long-standing series. Um, on a personal note, I'm thrilled to be able to finally give this talk, which I wrote in anticipation um, of giving, if memory serves correctly, in late March or early April of 2020, and was postponed due to the earliest stages of sorting out what became the new normal of pandemic life. But on the positive side of things, we're mostly back to normal, uh, with several exceptions. And my thoughts on the topic have evolved as I've progressed in the revision of my manuscript. So hopefully my offering here today will be the more interesting for it, uh, which leads me to my own paper here today. Uh, now, uh, what I'm going to present to you all here now is part of a larger project that began originally as my doctoral dissertation, um, which I've spent the last few years converting into a book. Now, I must acknowledge up front that my work set against the backdrop of our little corner of the Bancroft is not exactly par for the course of Western Americana, which so accurately encapsulates many of the library's holdings, but it is certainly no less important for its place in the history of benefaction that undergirds much of Berkeley's early history. Well, you know, I sort of, I, I wink and nod to you all that this is not exactly standard Bancroft fare, but I will make my case that it's just important, if not more so, to the broad scope of world history. So the argument I'll present to you today draws from several chapters of this project, which examines how the economy of Egypt fits into that of the Eastern Mediterranean and how broader developments in the sphere influence the economy of Egypt and vice versa. So after the conquest of Alexander the Great, the Greeks are rightly credited with importing into Egypt many new administrative and fiscal instruments that were used in both Macedon and many Greek cities, especially Athens. But what has only recently begun to be appreciated is how the fiscal practices in Egypt were already showing some institutional drift uh, in these directions prior to Macedonian control. Uh, moreover, longstanding prior institutional arrangements that had been in place in Egypt for millennia continued to influence how the Ptolemies structured those of their state. Um, all of this is to say that the economic history of this region is an exceptionally complex and interrelated series of phenomena that developed and changed over time. And I'll be focusing on outlining longer term fiscal developments in Egypt and then how they manifested later in both Greece and then changed under Ptolemaic rule. So ultimately, what I'll be exploring is not just how, but why these institutions persisted through the late period of Egypt into the Hellenistic and Roman eras. Now, um, just as a quick word of background, um, in the very earliest stages of my project, uh, I was looking to explain rather simply how the Ptolemaic auction for tax farming concessions, monopolies, and so on was implemented and evolved over time. 
But what I found was you know, the real story that I was investigating was one of the most fundamental problems faced by rulers of ancient states, uh, raising revenue and the institutional arrangements that were created for this task. Uh, now, farming or leasing rents, that is to say the collection of state revenues to third parties by sale or auction as a phenomenon has a very large body of scholarship surrounding it. Uh, much of the focus, however, has been on early modern English or French versions of the process. Slightly less extensive, but recent focus has been given to the Ottoman versions of the process. And there's a fairly substantial dated body of literature surrounding the Publicani tax farmers in Rome. Um, indeed, I've spoken with Jose, albeit briefly, about how tax farming practices, variously referred to as asiento, arrendamiento, and carazón, manifested under the colonial government in New Spain, uh, and how some of our holdings here at Bancroft can nuance a broader understanding of the Spanish iteration of this practice in the early modern period. Um, however, the history of this process goes back much further in, than Rome. And you know, traditional wisdom suggests that there is often more to learn about a process if we look at the earliest versions of institutions. Now, public auctions for rent farming are recorded in Babylon, classical Greece, and in my own period of Ptolemaic Egypt, but they're never the sole mechanism of exchanges. And so by focusing on the concerns that drove states, and you know, at times often drove institutions within states, to seek revenue via these mechanisms, I look at the factors that influenced how and why ancient states sought solutions to funding their individual fiscal regimes and ultimately engendered new fiscal arrangements. So I argue the public auction is one part of a really big, larger ongoing process of fiscal development in the Eastern Mediterranean over the first millennium BC that included coinage, banking, monopolies, tax farming, and other advanced fiscal strategies. And what is just so striking is how these patterns of use and implementation repeat across cultures and when they do not, when they have clearly evolved as the result of endogenous factors, and when this is a battery of institutions just sort of grafted on to existing institutional structures, and then how they adapt or are adapted, how they perform when implemented in a polis, that is to say a city state, with or without a variable imperial hinterland, depending on time and how they scale when applied to a country the size of Egypt. And see, it's those moments of variability between test subjects when, in my opinion, the most interesting revelations about sociocultural history can be discovered. Now, you'll note that I repeatedly invoke this, this technical term, institution, for much of my discussion. If you'll indulge me for one further moment while I briefly introduce the theoretical background from which my talk proceeds, I'll make a few quick points. Like many of the works of ancient economic history that have been written in the last two decades, I proceed from a new institutional economic or NIE approach, which has as one of its fundamental tenets that institutions and rules of the game matter. So I augment this framework with recent theoretical propositions from cultural evolutionary theory, which emphasize the role of people and culture to institutions and posit that institutions themselves can develop and transmit via a process of you know, descent via modification in the sense of early biological models. So institutional approaches to ancient economic history are particularly valuable insofar as our ancient subjects often lack continuous data sets that permit more technical economic manipulation, which you know, otherwise would really be the end of the story. So similarly, though it is much easier to explain the transmission of culture over time, one must consider how institutions fit into an evolutionary framework with a selection criteria, um, and how we then can integrate this with economic ideas like equilibrium outcome. So in this sense, in, in the broadest sense of what I do, the intersection of culture and institutions is about a set of decisions, and it is those decisions and their outcomes that we shall investigate. So now we turn our gaze to the period of Egyptian history that follows Alexander's conquest of former Persian imperial holdings and is generally considered the beginning of the Greco-Roman period. So the origin of these economic institutions are, are, are variously understood in a number of you know, different theoretical approaches. Um, you know, just because of time and the venue, I, I'll leave these on the screen, but one of the things that I want to, to sort of emphasize are, are twofold. One, that these have evolved over time as disciplines have evolved and thoughts about economic history have evolved. Um, there is a general disconnect between political theorization and economic theorization. 
Um, and so one of the things that I, I kind of come to this at is that there is a great, uh, a greater sort of granular approach that we can take the longer you take uh, account of the theoretical approaches uh, to these, this period. So uh, I will sort of gloss over this slide with a lot of text on it to bring us to our stage. Uh, and that is the Eastern Mediterranean during the first millennium BC. Now, depending on when and where one was standing on this map, you would have witnessed the development and spread of coinage and banking and tax farming and state monopoly and then the auction itself. Now, I often justify the importance of my research by the fact that these institutions are still with us uh, in modern manifestations. So tracing the origins and eventual combination of all of these institutions would exceed the time allotted to me here. So what I would like to do is focus on a series of case studies that illustrate the ways in which these institutions, which facilitated state extraction, developed and modified over time as they were transmitted by cultural actors between Egypt and the Hellenic sphere in Greece and eventually manifest in Ptolemaic Egypt. And along the way, uh, I'll highlight important examples of these phenomena that are held within our own collections here in the CTP. So as a way of background, um, during the New Kingdom and late period of Egyptian history, uh, fiscal policy manifested in a manner distinct from what would appear under the Ptolemies. There was over time, however, a gradual incline during the Sayite and Persian periods towards new institutional patterns that roughly correspond to an increase in political pressures uh, emanating from Northern concerns, as opposed to sort of you know, standard pharaonic foci to the South, as well as a traceable increase in foreign traders and settlers in the country, particularly those from Greece. Now this is not to mention structures of outright foreign domination and political reorientation. In New Kingdom Egypt, the in new economy had a large redistributive sector dominated by the state, nominally the pharaoh, uh, and temple estates. Um, the most important revenue during this period was the annual grain harvest tax, or shemu, which was used by both temple and state institutions to support priests and dependent personnel, cultivators and craftsmen, who were paid wages consisting of grain or of bread and beer produced with grain at institutional bakeries and breweries. So weights of copper, silver, and grain appear but they are treated as goods rather than as money, uh, or specifically even as coinage. So during the Sayite and Persian periods in Egypt, most taxes continued to be rendered in grain. However, during this time, the state and its agents, the temples, also began collecting taxes in money alongside those in kind and in labor. So in contrast to harvest taxes collected from the measurements of fields or labor taxes from census of the people, these new money taxes were only levied when potential objects of taxation passed through checkpoints monitored by the state and its agents. So Brian Muse nominally refers to this as bottleneck taxation. And the earliest of these money taxes were sales taxes on real estate transfers. Uh, given the highly agrarian makeup of Egypt's society, it makes sense that the use of silver in society would have spread from the top down and was likely restricted to merchants and traders at the earliest stages, and more importantly, to expensive transactions like real estate transfers. So in the ninth and early eighth century, temples had already established notaries to record real uh, property transfers. And by the late seventh century, temples used these notaries to collect uh, the tenth of scribes and representatives. It's a 10% tax on the value of property involved in any transfer. So receipts in the form of a statement that this tax had been paid to the Temple of Amun are preserved in these papyri here in both uh, demotic uh, as well as in abnormal hieratic. And so this manifested as a functional 10% tax on any property that was sufficiently valuable to require a title document to protect the new owner's rights to this property. So those of you with a, uh, an eye for fiscal minutia and philosophical texts might also note that this echoes the percentages in the story about this period from Pseudo-Aristotle, in which the general Chabrias advised King Tacos to demand a tax of one opal on the sale of each artipa of grain and one-tenth of the profits from shipping and manufacturing. Now, similarly, uh, during these periods, temples seemed to have administered and controlled access to the cemeteries in the neighboring deserts. And beginning in the Sayite period, burial plots had to be purchased from temples on which they began collecting a money tax on the burial of the dead in the sixth century. 
temples collected the tax from the mortuary priests who buried and performed rituals for the dead and who received a significant payment from the deceased relative for doing so. A temple official known as the overseer or agent of the necropolis received silver for the purchase of tombs or the plot of land on which it was built uh, and issued receipts for the payments. In a number of texts dating to various pharaohs of the late period, the overseer of the necropolis declares to a tomb owner that he is satisfied with the money for a tomb that the mason has built, um, in one case declaring to a coakite that he is satisfied with the money for a plot of land. Now, the overseer of the necropolis also received payments for the right to bury individual mummies and tombs above the cost of the tombs themselves. Now, in a papyrus from year 38 of Amasis, the necropolis, uh, the overseer of the necropolis acknowledges to his superior the receipt of a red bull, not red bull, uh, as payment for the burial of an individual. Now, in the Sayite and Persian periods, the state also started directly collecting customs duties levied at the border on goods entering Egypt. So uh, to facilitate this, the state may have required foreign merchants and traders to enter Egypt only at designated points, uh, thereby creating bottlenecks at which it could collect customs duties on goods. There, uh, so obviously physical bottlenecks at the borders of Egypt were not new, but this is the first time we have customs duties being collected uh, and recorded in documents. So for physical locations of custom duty payments, some of you may be thinking now of the Greek settlement at Naukritis, which is surely emblematic of this trend. Herodotus describes how Naukritis at earlier times was the only emporion or trading port in Egypt, and that, that ships that came to any branch, uh, any other branch of the Nile, that is, were required to sail on to the Canopic branch to Naukritis. He describes this concentration of trade at Naukritis as a royal privilege, but again, it could have served as a bottleneck at which customs duties could be levied, um, even if there's no direct evidence from the Sayite period. Now, the earliest direct evidence that we have uh, comes from an Aramaic papyrus from Elephantine, which contests, contains a palimpsest text of a register of customs duties collected in money from Ionian and Phoenician ships and cargoes. Now, the customs duties, again, consist of 10% of the cargo payable in kind, and a money tax collected silver of the men, payable in gold or silver. Now, while this text was found in Elephantine, south of Egypt, it does not name that site, and most of the ships named within it came from Ionia or Phoenicia, so there has been some discussion that the papyrus was originally written at a northern site, like Memphis, Naucratus, or Heraclion Thonis, and was written later brought to the south at Elephantine. Now, speaking of Heraclion Thonis, this was located at the mouth of the uh, Canopic branch of the Nile, downstream from Naucratus and served as its harbor. The role of Heraclion Thonis as the customs collection point for this city is confirmed by a pair of nearly identical basalt stelae erected at the two sites by King Nectanebo I. The stela from Heraclion Thonis dedicates 10% of the harbor custom dues, and local tax revenues to the local temple of Neith at Sias, while the stelae from Naukritis dedicates 10% of local tax revenues. Now, private exchange and officials' shifts and fiscal habit were certainly influenced during this period by the influx of outsiders coming into Egypt, whether they were Greek or otherwise, who were already accustomed to doing business with coinage. Now, I don't have time to recount to you the evidence surrounding the coin hoards during the periods leading up to the Ptolemaic period, which record over time how coins transition from being used as hack silver, as the name implied chopped up pieces of bullion, to proper units of account. But I will make several points at this juncture. By the late fifth century, demotic ostraca at the Karga Oasis in the south of Egypt record the use of a silver stator as a conversion for Egyptian debon, which suggests a wide awareness in Egypt of, a monet of monetary systems in use in the Mediterranean. At this time also, the earliest Egyptian imitations of Athenian tetradrams appear. And of the coin hoards buried after 480 BC, the Athenian tetradrams had a virtual monopoly, which may be due to similarities between their weight and traditional Egyptian weight standards. Now, dyes, uh, that is the items used for striking coins, uh, for producing unmarked imitations of Athenian tetradrams have been found at several dispersed locations in Egypt, suggesting decentralized rather than official production. And of course, 
official issues of coinage did occur under local pharaohs and Persian satraps, including the famous gold issues, likely by Nectanebo II, with the Nebu Nefer, good or perfect gold, hieroglyphic inscription on the verso. And of course, after the Persians reconquered Egypt, King Artaxerxes III produced a series of imitation Athenian tetradrams and fractions thereof, marked with the Demotic Egyptian label, Pharaoh Artaxerxes. And at the same time, the Egyptian satraps, Sabakes and Mazakes, produced imitation tetradrams and fractions marked with the Aramaic labels of their names. However, again, like the Near East, uh, you know, much of this evidence for the pr presence and likely use of coins uh, in the Persian period is limited to those areas closer to the Mediterranean. Now, my point here is to illustrate how in the period immediately uh, prior to Alexander, Egypt had already taken its first steps into a broader process of integration into a wider Eastern Mediterranean koine with respect to the media of exchange and the nature of revenue that was collected but it was doing so in a slow manner, mediated by Egyptian cultural concerns. Now, turning to classical Athens uh, briefly, the responsibilities for collecting state revenue were farmed out via auction to entrepreneurs or groups of means who were accountable to the state. I've left the relevant sections of the fourth century constitution of Athens, the Athenaion Politeia of Pseudo-Aristotle on the screen for reference's sake, as it records the administration of the process. Um, I'll quickly run through some highlights. Um, sellers were agents of the governing body who auctioned all the state contracts for leases of public land and the silver mines, the contracts of tax collecting, the building work contracts and concessions, and the property of defendants that the law courts had confiscated. Now, the boule, the governing body, received a number of records of this process, copy of the taxes, how much they were farmed, when payments were due, and a records of the items confiscated. So. The boule likewise held the records of these installments that these auction winners had to pay on wax tablets. Now, payments could be crossed off that way on the wax. Um, now, they were in charge of this office called the Gravitaeon, but this task was a public uh, duty that was performed by these receivers who were chiefly responsible for collecting it uh, for the government. Now, Aristotle's primary focus is upon the internal mechanisms of the state which leaves us for, with precious little to go on for the form that auctions took or their origin as a mechanism of state fiscality, suggesting that the process must have been well understood without an explanatory digression. So we don't know with any certainty beyond the comment uh, here at 7.2 that this existed in the time of Spolon, Solon. Um, so in, again, when you think about tax farming, it's all about not having to form a tax collection wing. Uh, and having a higher guaranteed profit. Um, so one must think that this was something that was done by high status individuals, and that of course, abuse was always uh, a threat as happened at Colophon when a series of local rustics were taken advantage of by tax farmers from another village, and only later was the abuse discovered. So um, it's worth noting, of course, that during this time period that uh, you know tax farming could be conducted on the scale of a single tax uh, for a single city and its immediate area, or in the most extreme cases uh, during the fourth century, this concession to a series of allied island city-states, as in the grain tax law of 374-373. So remember, this should remind us the act of raising revenue in the Greek world was relatively local uh, between the point of collection and deposit with the state. So banks were of certainly available to the Greek city-states, and as coinage became the foundation for the Greek and definitely the Athenian fiscal system, banking was developed to supplement it. So as these individual political economics at the city-state level developed hundreds of individual coinages, specialized professionals appeared to convert these issues to local currency. And in Greece, in addition to currency exchange, they were places of coin testing, deposit holding, and loans, especially to Greek elites. Now, despite the range of services they offered, in the Greek world, they were private ventures, which all changed as one evolved through the, the period, eventually into the Hellenistic stage, when public banks were modified into a new form. That is a bank for the state to make and receive payments. 
which sort of sets the stage for the after um, in my time lapse of my study. So as I move on to how these institutions changed and were modified in Ptolemaic Egypt. So I hope thus far, as briefly as I could, I've demonstrated that Egypt was trending towards slowly adopting other developments that were ongoing in the rest of the Eastern Mediterranean. And that Greece, particularly Athens, was in possession of what John Davies refers to as a refined and articulated fiscal expertise, which we shall see appeared in a distinct manner in Ptolemaic Egypt, which itself presented a number of challenges to a new regime. The size of the country, a population of largely native Egyptians under a new Greco-Macedonian king, scattered urban areas, temple complexes that exerted incredible economic and social power and economic threats from other successors. Though our records for the early years of Ptolemaic rule are frustratingly thin, we know that they continued the striking of Alexander issue coins after his death and then began to mint issues of their own once Ptolemy I finally declared himself king. And at some time quite early in their reign, they also insisted that taxes be collected in coin, which was a fundamental shift in the statewide collection of many taxes, but it's worth noting would exist alongside the customary economy of collection of tax, grain taxes in kind. So um, when you think about this, the implementation of this decision to collect money taxes required the creation of a money collection wing, which the Ptolemies understandably based upon familiar models that were largely Greek, but also required negotiation with prior patterns in Egypt to varying extents. The fiscal regime of the new Ptolemaic political economy was structured from an early stage to extract revenue in cash. So this fiscal arm was uh, the public auction of contracts to ensure that this was done. Now this was modified for a new type of tax farming, as well as for new monopoly concessions to industries and likely the collection of those taxes upon them as well. So both were done via, again, public auctioning contracts that bound the winners to perform services in conjunction with state actors. And again, banking and lending practices formed the backbone of this fiscal system. State revenue was converted into coin at the local level by these state agents, who paid their collections into the Royal Bank. In turn, the banks provided a mechanism for transferring funds for royal payments throughout this large country. Uh, and again, uh, it's worth noting that uh, in both cash and a version of sort of off the books in zero transfers. Indeed, the stipulations that require tax farming and monopoly contracts to be paid in regular intervals in cash ensured that the local administrations were liquid throughout the year. So the development of such an armature uh, and implementation of this new requirement to pay taxes in cash created direct vertical connections between the court, those at the top of the state, and those living in the countryside. In addition to monetizing the state, it created uh, what's called uh, competition among local elites and incorporated them into this new system of extracting free floating resources. So in Ptolemaic Egypt, theoretically speaking, the collection of taxes was in hands of royal agents at various levels, from the local chief financial officers to tax collectors, known as legotai, uh, primary out, primarily outlined in great detail for us in the aforementioned uh, Revenue Laws Papyrus, um, which uh, is a very large treatise outlining different stages of revenue collection in Egypt. Um, but these duties can also be understood better read in light of Berkeley's own PTEPT 703 an exceptionally important document for understanding the nature of state revenue extraction as explained in an official memorandum from one high official uh, to another. So following Athenian practice, a successful bidder for a tax farm was uh, a tax farmer or a teloni, but the tax collectors actually collected the tax and then were paid from the proceeds of the tax rather than by the tax collector. So tax farming in Egypt, a tax farmer can be seen as an underwriter in one sense. So the administration of this Ptolemaic state due to its scale adapted this rather you know, sort of simple Athenian model and removed and supplanted the role of several of the Athenian offices like the sellers with tax collectors and bank officials. Now money tax collectors, uh, again, these logotai were not part of this official hierarchy uh, these were appointed by agreement between the oikonomos, a 
a financial official and the tax farmer to collect a particular money tax in a particular district, so at a very small scale, um, for a set period of time of the contract, usually a year, and they were paid a fixed wage of 30 drachma a month out of the same revenue account of the tax farmer into which the taxes were paid. So our piece here at Berkeley emphasizes the ability of higher officials to audit these accounts on a village by village basis and compel the tax farmers to pay into them when they showed a deficit. So uh, tax collection districts were separate from a sort of regular administrative district. So we were dealing with different animals here. Um, and sometimes they go down to about 2000 people and operate on geographic features. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions I ask is, you know, from a practical perspective, you had tax collectors, why did we need a tax farmer in this case? Well, the, the first, the system ensured a predictable amount was guaranteed to be received by the state in monetary form. And so to profit, you know, these bidders must have come as close as possible to pre uh, the, the last tax or even exceeding it. Um, and so they also appear to receive a tax salary in proportion to the income from the state if they fulfill their contract. And of course, the typical interpretation of this was that a winning bidder would benefit, would returns, would exceed expectation, which tends to encourage predation. Um, however, unlike the Athenian system, the bidders aren't the ones going out there and shaking down the population. So what's, what's interesting is that once the royal officials, that is these collectors collected the tax, there was a balancing. And so they pay the tax farmer after this only if there was a surplus receiving his bid. And so the contractor, uh, the farmer, actually supervised the collector. And they you get these moments where they're balancing each other back and forth in their accounts. And so collectors were required to notify the contractor of any payment they received. And they were liable to this huge fine 50 times any amount they were not uh, reporting. And of course, this same injunction is on the contractor to report the same misreported sum to his superiors. And so uh, basically, the Ptolemies used two methods to constrain these collecting officials, holding them personally liable and then guaranteeing help with this dual system. And so we're in this sense, they're reducing risk by relieving tax officials of some fiscal responsibility and hopefully, or at least theoretically, deterring corruption. Um, and again, in theory, they serve as a check against the corruption of the other, though I imagine the worst case for the local Egyptian taxpayer uh, was that they you know, would collude to doubly extort them. Now, once the decision to implement tax farming had been made, the monarch and his agents were faced with sort of the big question, which is how to do this. And so you, know, you have this dual system uh, where there likely has some sort of origin in the Greco-Macedonian system instituted by the, uh, the, uh, the Philip uh, and eventually Alexander and Macedon, um, but we don't have any direct evidence for Macedonian rule. Um, so what, what's fascinating is that this is a moment where we have two systems, therefore two cultures, colliding in real time in our evidences, and the, uh, our evidence bases, that is, and they're creating a new institution. So what, what I think is really fascinating is that we can point to some prior practice in Egypt for tax collectors and the structure um, for how this would have been done, particularly on how they knew about their tax paces. So in P count 22 and 23, we have individuals divided by records, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in the tax collection records, uh, not just by district and villages, but by professions. Now, Dorothy Thompson and Kathleen Van Dorpa uh, have both rightly highlighted that ethnic designations were employed in Egypt by those who shared a tax category, whether they were actually ethnic terms like Hellene or Persian or a different professional terminology. One fascinating letter from the Oikonomos Metrodoros records instructions to a certain Apollonius, his representative in a division of the Fayum. We shall be in Oxyrinca on the 26th day at daybreak for the sale of the concessions and the agreements. Therefore collect the ethne, these groups, in the aforenamed village on the 26th, so we are not held up in the striking of agreements. Now these ethnic groups may have had a precedent in prior Egyptian practice, as Herodotus records seven main groups, or genea, the root genus might look familiar to you there, in the Egyptian population. 
priests, military, cowherds, swineherds, merchants, interpreters, and Nile pilots. What we have here then is perhaps a case of the Ptolemies continuing a system of social differentiation in its tax administration that reflected traditional organization of Egyptian society. So we, when we combine this knowledge with the Ptolemaic continuation of the practice of a house by house census, the contours of how this hybrid system came to be formed can begin to be understood as they evolved. Now, um, the use and incorporation of local knowledge bases in Egypt may also have factored into the decision to incorporate the farming of rents. Uh, local business agents could perform as both professionals and tax farmers in their field. Uh, in a text from Lille, uh, P. Dem, Lille Dem 276, uh, a certain Artemidorus, son of Agathon, uh, appears as a professional washer of a certain village Philateris. And the same Artemidorus appears as a tax farmer of the Nitroke tax in P. Petri uh, 11, uh, uh, 11273, making him simultaneously a washer and a tax farmer. So if you think about being a, uh, an administrator at this time, you're trying to take advantage of local expertise. And so taxes were therefore claimed from members of groups registered as liable for a tax, and often members who were belonging to professional themselves, who were familiar with structures, habitations, and compositions in a group. So they were in a position either to contract the tax themselves or make sure that the tax volume was calculated realistically and could be collected properly. So the tax farming concessions were a way of securing tax volume, yes, but also for the state to keep track of industries that would have required an enormous bureaucratic armature while simultaneously taking advantage of local expertise and knowledge of these institutions. Now, obviously the entrepreneurial side of the tax farming business may have been one aspect, uh, like some of the major taxes that we have recorded in the Fayum, um, but they may not represent the more typical situation. These entrepreneurs would have had at their disposal money and sureties guaranteeing money with mortgages on their plots. But the sheer volume of transactions that were theoretically taxed in Egypt suggests there was a need for more than just entrepreneurs of large means. So given the large number of modest and very small economic activities taxed in cash throughout Egypt, excuse me, um, it was a small tax farmer related to this ethnos group who assisted the state in the taxation process. Now, by a sort of employing locals to collect and guarantee uh, taxes, the Ptolemies also mitigated against widespread tax flight by tapping into local social networks that would have created community-based buy-in to this process and shamed those who refused to pay their share, which we should note was different than those individuals who were unable to pay taxes. So the incorporation of multiple tax levels and ethnos groups in the vast taxation mechanism of this big state would have integrated far more local actors into the functioning of it. And would have, in doing so, they grant local elites of various wealth levels a share in the state's success and received in return a countryside that was far more integrated to the court and a mechanism where elites and entrepreneurs competed with each other, that is rather with the state, uh, to gather their own resources. So as we close on time, I will sort of assess a few things. Uh, I will skip over the earliest recorded uh, rent farming uh, text that we have here. It's worth noting that it's within the temple sphere. So even, and it's very early in the Ptolemaic period at 291 BC. Uh, it's a beautiful papyrus from the British Museum. And what's interesting about this is that already during this early stage of Ptolemaic rule, uh, about 15, 20 years in, that they have already begun the process throughout the country. Um, of course, I'd like to mention one final manifestation of this Greek importation that's easy to lose sight of, juxtaposed against larger concerns of collection of state revenue. Um, simply put, once this uh, institution was imported, and started being used for tax farming, they trickled down again into virtually every sphere of state control. And as we've seen a moment ago into the area, elite areas of temples. So one manifestation of this was actually really my gateway uh, into the broader project I began was the auction of abandoned land. Um, just as the Athenians auctioned off everything from soup to nuts like confiscated amphorae, there was no sale that the Ptolemaic government did not see as a nail that the hammer of the auction could not properly uh, remedy. 
Um, so for instance, in PTAB 871, which will be appearing shortly in our long awaited keepsake, uh, some property whose nature is lost in the lacuna, um, a very obvious lacuna given the shape of the text, was advertised and sold by the local officials of Crocodilopolis after appropriate time had elapsed following its confiscation and announcement for sale. The same phenomenon can be documented in P. Hearst 7, a will from a family archive from Dero Ballas, in which the transfer history of several parcels of land is recorded, several of which were sold at the Aish and Per A'a, that is the auction of Pharaoh. It's an incredibly long and fascinating text, but for our purposes, it's worth noting for several points that these transactions are occurring uh, and are recorded in Demotic as well as Greek, but also that many of these Southern sales occurring during the early decades of the second century BC, a time immediately following a period of great revolt in Egypt. Now this text and several like it likely record the aftermath of the state selling the property of those who fought against them or fled during this period of incredible political instability. So today I hoped to present to you a rather prolonged, if uh, brief <laughs> argument, uh, illustrated along the way with case studies that speak to several points. That the institutional forms of extraction in Egypt have predecessors in both Pharaonic and Greek practice. However, when examined through an institutional lens, the history of the political economy of Ptolemaic Egypt is more than just a sum of the two. It's this dynamic and negotiated fiscal system that evolved with specific political and historical constraints and that was applied over this enormous geographic area and heterogeneous population. Various institutional practices that appear to be Greek in nature can actually be documented in Egypt prior to the Ptolemies and persisted and changed in turn under Ptolemaic rule. In going through these choices, I've attempted to stay away from the traditional um, NIE over the simplification of attributing every decision of a pre-modern state to, uh, to transaction costs, which was surely a motivating factor for many of these developments, but definitely not the entire story. The notion of the overwhelming similarity between the Athenian fiscal system and the Ptolemaic system has been commented upon for 130 years at this point. But I think that with some of the more modern theoretical treatment of the spread of institutions, and by highlighting the changes in Egypt before and after, we can articulate how these institutions both had precursors in and were transmitted to Egypt and then evolved over time. And I thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Hi Andy, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Um, there is one question uh, from uh, Christine. We, we were having at the beginning some issues with her sound and so, she asked it in the chat. Um, if you could tell us uh, how, if how, and where these coins were stored, were there vaults, or if if so, where where were these vaults? Okay, um, so uh, there, I I don't. Christine's question uh, plays on a, a number of different levels. So uh, when you know you you make a, the 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 coins that I was talking about for the large part began with these unofficial strikings and then uh, eventually uh, went on to these state-sponsored ones, right? So um, if you're asking about uh, where they would have been, they would have been minted. The, the general theory is that the unofficial ones were done by these tra traveling moneyers who would have then given them to people. Um, private individuals would have put them into jars or bags and the coin hoards that I mentioned in passing uh, are those that were sort of hidden, often uh, ascribed to political, uh, how shall we say, uh, uh, turbulence. Uh, and in so far as you bury your coins, the theory is you come back unless something really bad happens. And so private individuals would be storing coins uh, like this one here uh, in jars in their home, kind of buried in the backyard. But uh, the state when they eventually began uh, funding uh, coinage in, under the, uh, the Persians and, and these issues, and then again under the Ptolemies, uh, what would have happened is that they would have begun storing them as uh, in the local sort of striking houses. And so um, there are royal treasuries. And part of the talk that I cut out is looking at how uh, banking as it's implemented, 
is actually a, a separate evolution of the uh, pharaonic practice of royal uh, treasuries uh, and uses liter uh, language and other things from granaries. So there, there's a system in place for a lot of these things that informs how it comes to be, be set up under the Ptolemies. Thank you. Uh, and uh, from Lorik, was there any form of interest charged on the late payments or, or if payments were not made? What were some of the issues that could occur? Yeah, so uh, for the taxpayers, uh, the ta so again, we, we have this weird system, which I'm, I'm working on a kind of separate think piece on, uh, where you've got tax collectors and tax farmers, and they're, they're sort of working together uh, at the, the very local level, uh, and they're going in and they're auditing each other um, pretty regularly. Um, for the late payments, uh, the, the fee is there, I'm, I'm trying to think back to the text itself uh, in P-Count. Specifically speaking, there is a fee for the, uh, the imbalancing in the count. Now, if you mean for taxpayers themselves, there are theoretical uh, interest payments that are owed for late taxes, uh, which are interesting to explore. But what's fascinating is when you look at the documents, and particularly in these uh, pieces of cartonnage that are in Vienna, what you see is a very different picture from what you uh, might, depending on which one you pick up. So in some of these tax registers, you have something like, I think it's like 94% taxes reported on time. And then if you look at the next one, literally in the same mummy, uh, it's down to like 16. And so what's really fascinating about that is that we know that there are many of these hypothetical proclamations that are kept in storehouses. And what's really almost sort of being taken for granted among the, the shorthand of those that work on this in my field that hasn't really disseminated is that texts like uh, P. Revlaws and P. Tep 703 are more of the, uh, let's call it the, the administration proclaiming the ideal scenario. And that the more we look at the granular level, the more it is done at the unofficial sort of inside, like, okay, We'll advertise this for particular item, and it reminds me of the um, gosh, what is it? Often the, the penny auctions that happened in Oklahoma uh, in the early 20th century when homes were being foreclosed upon. Like you'd often have community buy-in, where say you know the grandmother couldn't pay for a certain tax of this or that, and so uh, they would have uh, a different person uh, pay to, or in that case, it was uh, the collecting of the tax. Um, but they would have family members who would be the only people bidding. And you have to have a sense there's a cultural aspect to this. Um, I hope that answers your question, Mark. And then uh, one more from Mohammed. Uh, again, thanking you for your very informative presentation. His question is, how did the collection of papyri here at Berkeley help you tell this particular tax story? But also, what other stories uh, can we tell from this collection and what, what other highlights? Well, the, the third question uh, of, of what other stories the Berkeley papyri can tell, I am both biased and I would be overwhelmed trying to recount all of them. And I, I would surely do them all a disservice to the some 27,000 pieces that we have here at Berkeley. Um, I, uh, I, so I will, I will deflect that as nicely as possible because it's just, it, it's, it's too, too much to answer. Uh, as far as, you know, what, what other pieces here at Berkeley uh, and how important they are. This uh, order of the Dioikates to the Oikonomos uh, is simply put uh, foundational for understanding the, the fiscal structure of Ptolemaic Egypt, particularly in the type, uh, in, the, in the, the breadth of these sort of ideal types of proclamations like this and the revenue laws papyrus. Um, what is sort of more, you know, sort of, a, a, interesting, I, I took uh, a two sort of two representative types. Uh, we have uh, the administrative types and then the local records where we have a mention of an auction uh, text or something like that. But uh, there are hundreds of texts that record different levels of tax collection, both, excuse me, both the, the collection and administration of it, uh, but also uh, the receipts. And so you'll excuse me again, uh, what uh, I think sort of the, the, the general answer is that they, 
I, I set an article up ages ago, both for sort of like official tax documents that we can record with option auctions and records of these things, so the testamenta. And the testamenta here at Berkeley are just exceptionally rich in their nature for that. So uh, it, it's about comparable to, uh, you know, I'd say a good quarter of my overall documents that I've looked at in that sense. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Um, I was really interesting, uh, you know, because there is this connection to the Latin Americana material. Um, I think one of, you know, one of the, the items that we, we, the items produced in the colonial period in Mexico under Spanish rule, you know, the, the codices that are now called codices, many of these were actually part of the lawsuits that were filed by indigenous populations against the oppressive tax system um, that the Spanish were um, in, imposing on them, especially um, after the new laws of the 1540s where we went from trading kind to actually coinage. So once coins begin to be minted, there is this, the, the Codice Osuna is the one that comes to mind more prevalent as, as this bigger um, fight between the indigenous population and the, and the court, using the courts, using Spanish courts to, to fight back some of that, um, some of these, you know, egregious taxes that were being placed on them. And, and, and a lot of them say, we've already contributed for the last 20 years. This is how much we've already contributed. How much more can you tax us? And what's really fascinating on these is the, the use of both indigenous language uh, and uh, Spanish to sort of tell their story. So I was really curious if you can talk a little bit more about the importance of using both Greek and Demotic in some of these texts, because you, you brought that up a couple of times in your presentation. And, I think for us, for, for the colonial side, it allows us to actually be able to interpret that because if it didn't have that text, that Spanish text, you know, a lot of the Nahuatl was lost. So we could reinterpret this material and begin to actually understand what's in these codices that way. But otherwise we wouldn't. Um, can you talk a little bit about that with the Greek and mnemonic? Certainly, I, and again, we, we need to talk more about this, you okay. and I, because it, it's such an interesting parallel in fiscal development. So, um, when one goes back to a lot of these theoretical treatises that I didn't linger over, um, what we see is that it is often portrayed in the lens of a sort of uh, early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, very, uh, how shall we say, uh, colonial model in that sense. It's It's easy to say that. And that's frankly one of the reasons why I like the cultural evolutionary theory aspect of it, because this gets us out of that mindset. It's, uh, again, we're, we're looking at real people that are really exchanging ideas, and it's not abstract frameworks. It's, it's striking a balance between the two. Right. And so um, as far as the evidence base uh, for demotic and Greek and what we learn from each of them, uh, this has often been set up uh, generally speaking in kind of geographic terms uh, because you have further Greek penetration into the north. And so uh, most of our collection here is from the Fayum, uh, from Teptunis. Uh, but if we were to look at uh, evidence from, you know, say Thebes in the south of Egypt, where, uh, you know, if you think about moving south, the penetration of Greek control and the, the frankly uh, exceptionally large uh, influence of temple complexes was still looming during the Ptolemaic period. Um, I think what you can see are several things. One, it, it was going on in both document sets. Uh, and this is, of course, variable by time and by place. Um, when we look at it against the historical record, it, particularly the revolts that I alluded to, uh, there's a period of 20 years of revolts that occur during uh, basically the, the late second century before the Ptolemies can go to the south and reestablish control. Uh, and that is that we have a almost a greater increase in the physical manifestation of these things in Demotic and Greek texts in the south. And the eventual, if long-term, phasing out of Demotic uh, as social and cultural conditions mediate uh, sort of, there's a, a I, I keep mentioning former CTP lecture speakers, uh, Brian McGing, who came and spoke about Smiley a few years ago. He has a series of articles looking at the fundamental tension of the Egyptian state being a purely cultural aspect in that sense. And uh, the school of thought that I come from 
uh, emphasizes that it was more of a uh, an elite non-elite structural tension that's so there's many ways uh to, to slice the, the pie up on that but uh, I'll, I'll finish my ramble simply by saying that they're both integral and they are both the new standard for interpreting these things um it's you you simply should not and cannot tell the full story without them great well thank you so much and i think we're right on the hour so great timing um that yeah, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we will have one more in May uh, where um, Randy Brandt will be uh, speaking to us about his collection of materials. And um, it's great to see you all and we hope to see you again in May. So thank you all for coming and thanks again, Andy. Fantastic presentation. And we'll definitely be in touch about some of the native materials here. Wish I wish I just had a photo of it. You know? Yeah, I know. If only, right? If only yeah. I had access to the stats. Yeah. Thank you again for coming. All right, take care.